Right, and another um, very important aspect of cell membrane transport that you will need to be aware of is the concept of the transportation of large molecules across cell membranes. And this is termed either endocytosis, which is the transport of large molecules into the cell, or exocytosis, which is the transport of large molecules out of the cells. And here, there's two very distinct examples of these two processes. The first one is an example of phagocyto um, endocytosis, which is termed phagocytosis. Basically, what you have in your um, immune system cells called macrophages or phagocytes, which is capable of recognizing and also swallowing up the microbes or pathogens and digesting them inside the cell in order to um, neutralize the infection. And this is a process, this eating up the pathogen is a process that we know as endocytosis. And sorry, this is a typo, but this is an example of exocytosis and it can be found in a process called neurotransmission in which we have a neuron cells that contains a lot of neurotransmitters contained inside little vesicles inside your neurons. And when it's ready to perform neurotransmission, what it will do is it will just um, expel these vesicles out into the junction here. And this process of um, expelling out these big vesicles are called an exocytosis. So these are the two um, mechanisms of transporting very large molecules across cell membranes. And now we come into the topic of cellular communication. In essence, cellular communications is a way for our cells to talk to each other. We know you know you're an, a multicellular organism, so you have a lot of different cells in all over your body, and in order um, for us all to function in sync then there, there needs to be a way for our cells to talk to each other and this is called cell communication and there's two vital components to this communication which is the message itself which is a ligand and the someone who will receive the message or a molecule that will receive the message which in this case is usually a cell membrane protein ligands are the messages that will come from another cell or another gland in our body and it's typically composed of hormones neurotransmitters or growth factors meanwhile receptors are molecules on the target cell which functions as ligand recipients now, depending on how far the signal travels across our body, we can sort of divide cellular communication into either endocrine signaling, paracrine signaling, or autocrine signaling. Basically, in endocrine signaling, we use hormones as our ligand. And what happens is that these hormones will enter the bloodstream from where they're secreted. For example, your thyroid gland will make thyroid hormones, which will then go into the blood and travel so far to reach all the other cells that will require the hormone and this very far travel is called endocrine signaling meanwhile there's another kind of signaling in which one cell communicates to the neighbor cell and this is called paracrine signaling this is the case um, as with neurotransmission or talking or signaling between neurons which are very close to each other but not but um, so we call them neighboring communication and then there's autocrine signaling in which cells will secrete ligands that will then communicate to itself and create changes in um, and cellular effects and this is very common in immune cells now um, once again, in order to do all this communication, there's basically three processes or three steps to cell communication. First is reception, second is transduction, and third is response. Basically, from the name, you can tell reception means to receive. So when a ligand comes to a cell and the receptor on the cell receives this ligand, that process is called reception. What happens next is that the receptor will then initiate changes across the cell, inside the cell, so that the signal will reach all the necessary organelles, such as the nucleus. So that the cell can change and this is called transduction this process of transmitting the signal from the receptor into the target organelle and then we have a response in which our cell provides a response or an answer or a change towards that signal and this can be in the form of changes in gene expression or changes in metabolism ion transport cell movement or enzymatic reaction it all depends on what the signal is Hence, let's talk about the different kinds of signal. Basically, the different kinds of ligands are divided into their hydrophobicity. Is it either hydrophilic or is the ligand hydrophobic? Let's start with hydrophobic ligands. We know hydrophobic means 
lipids you know uh, molecules that do not like water and this is the same as our cell membrane so what we have is these lipid based hormones for example and we have our lipid based cell lipid bilayer cell membrane and when lipid finds another lipid basically they will just allow the lipid through and this is exactly what happens with our hydrophobic hormones when hydrophobic hormones come up to a cell membrane it can just go past directly through the membrane and find the um, their targets and create a lot of changes in the cell and this is the case with steroid hormones mineral corticoids vitamin D's A's and thyroid hormones Meanwhile, when we have a hydrophilic hormone, meaning it does not like fat, but it does like water, then what we have is these signals that can't pass directly like the steroid hormone. So what do we need? We need a receptor on the surface to catch the signal, which the receptors are usually proteins that we talked about previously. And this hydrophilic signal will then, um, when it binds the receptor, the receptor will create signal cascades which will then reach the target organelles. And this is the case with peptide hormones or amines. And um, in order to catch these two different ligands, we have a couple different receptors. For hydrophobic ligands, we only need one receptor, which is a nuclear receptor. Meanwhile, for the hydrophilic ligands, we can use three different receptors, which is the ligand-gated ion channel, the GPCR, or the kinase-linked receptors. We'll now talk about them one by one. So what exactly is a ligand-gated ion channel or an ionotropic receptor? From the name, you can kind of tell what it is. Ligand-gated ion channel, meaning that there's a channel here and it's connected to a gate and the gate depends on whether or not there's a ligand. So when a ligand comes and binds to the receptor, the receptor will create an opening in the gate and it will allow the passing or influx of ions. Now, depending on what the ion is, we can either have a process called hyperpolarization or depolarization occurring inside the cell. And this will create a lot of cellular effects. And because it's a really quick, fast process, this is a mechanism that is often found with acetylcholine receptors, GABA receptors and glutamate receptors, which are all receptors for neurotransmitters. So with neurotransmission, everything happens really quickly. And this, um, this particular channel or this particular receptor plays a very big role in there. Now there's another receptor that can be used by the hydrophilic hormones, which is the GPCR. I like to call this the very lazy receptor, but this is a very unofficial name. The official name for the GPCR is a seven transmembrane or the serpentine receptor. Exactly why is it called the GPCR and why do I call it lazy? Well, because as you can see, this receptor is bound to a G protein. It's always bound to a G protein. And the reason why I think it's lazy is because this receptor cannot do anything. All it does is just recognize the ligand and then it will tell the G receptor to do all the work. Now, as how, does, how exactly does that work? So here we have the receptor in a non-active form. So there's no ligand here only the receptor. When there's no ligand, the receptor is bound to the G protein. This is the G protein in purple. It is a heterotrimer protein composed of the alpha, gamma and beta subunits. And when it's not active, it's bound with GDP. So in when the res when a res sorry when a ligand comes and binds the receptor, the receptor then will tell the G protein to do all the work. How does it uh, how does it start? Well, first it will exchange GDP for GTP. Once it's bound to GTP, it will dissociate or it will separate from the receptor and it will start working. Exactly how does it start working? Well, it turns out the G protein is pretty lazy itself, so it will just perf um, activate what we call secondary messengers or our effectors here. These are our secondary messengers activated by the G protein. And these secondary messengers will create calcium release, phosphorylation, and all these different chemical processes, which will then create um, cellular effect. After all that happens, the GTP will then be swapped again for the GDP and the receptor comes back to its inactive state. And this is these are examples of the ligands that use this very lazy receptor. So it's very lazy, but very common. Anyway, 
um, as you can see, uh, what I want to emphasize is that who does all the work in GPCR mediated processes? It's the secondary messenger, and we'll talk about that a bit more later. Now, the third one, the third receptor is the uh, for the hydrophilic hormone is the kinase linked receptor. From the name, you know that it's a receptor that is linked with a kinase enzyme. What is a kinase enzyme? A kinase enzyme is an enzyme that creates a process called phosphorylation. So on um, this receptor is not lazy like the GPCR. When it binds to a ligand, what happens is that this side of the receptor will then, the kinase side, will then create a process called protein phosphorylation which will directly affect transcription and protein synthesis. So it's very independent. Now, in essence, you can we've already talked about the three different types of hydrophilic receptors. How about the hydrophobic receptors? So we know that hydrophobic or lipid-based ligands can just pass through straight through the cell membranes because basically they're friends, and it will find its receptor, which is located in the nucleus. So the nucleus, um, so the receptor in hydrophobic hormones are called nuclear receptors, and this will directly cause changes in gene transfer transcription, protein synthesis, and ultimately give effect to the cell. So now with that we know the four different kinds of receptors, we can see that there's a lot of different mechanisms going on for signal transduction, but basically we can divide them into two main mechanisms. The first is through phosphorylation, and second is through secondary messengers. If you recall um, the kinase linked receptor, it's an example of an enzyme that utilizes phosphorylation. The receptor is bound to a kinase enzyme which can initiate a process called phosphorylation and in turn it can also cause dephosphorylation through another enzyme called phosphatase. So it's a very independent mechanism of transduction. Meanwhile, um, as in the case of the GPCR before, we see that the receptors in actually activate other molecules that we call secondary messengers. So they are small molecules that can form signal transmission after the receptor binds to the ligand. And it's these small molecules that create all the changes and do all the work. So what are the different types of secondary messengers? Well, there's the calcium, cyclic AMP, and phosphatidyl inositol. Whatever secondary messengers they use, the gist of it is the same. Um, basically, the receptors in this case will just activate another molecule, and that molecule will then do all the work. And that, and sorry, that brings us to the end of the lecture on cellular. Um, cell membranes and cellular communication. Um, these are the references that I use throughout the lecture and you can check them out in order to get a, a better knowledge on the topic. And